This is DevOps in Agile Way Podcast. Hello again, everyone. Just to remind you, we are in the discussion with Lee Gilmore about serverless, enterprise serverless, architecture of the enterprise serverless, and the pros and cons of the uh, approaches to that. So last episode, we ended with the question about the vendor lock. And now, Lee, it's time to answer. I think that this cliffhanger was quite interesting. So, Lee, please, the stage is yours. Yeah, so for me, vendor locking is a good thing. Um, oh, and... you, you are the first person who mentioned that in the way. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason for that is obviously you want to get the best out of the serverless services that you can use. So, I don't know, you might be um, looking at saga patterns and, and orchestration. So, you could try and do that yourself and have that encompassed in a container and Obviously, that's cloud agnostic, but obviously the speed in which you can use step functions and the scalability around it and the cost around it and things like that, that is obviously just one aspect with step functions, but you can extrapolate that out, um, obviously, across many, many different services. Um, so, yeah, I, I think go all in on, on a particular vendor. The, the one thing in the back of my mind I do worry about a little bit, having done a lot of projects over the years of taking monolithic applications and porting them to um, kind of cloud native is probably the use of things like step functions in the future. And the reason I say this is across that enterprise, if you've got things like your business logic within ASL, uh, within step function language and, you know, across a myriad of different services, so it could be a, an API gateway with an upload to S3 and an S3 event triggers a Lambda, that Lambda puts something in DynamoDB and you have a stream and that then has a Lambda with an event off the back of it. That there is quite difficult to look at, you know, over a, an enterprise. That's just one small part of it. So everything at some point will become legacy and we'll be moving on to something else. It, it's that evolutionary architecture again. Everything will be superseded. I mean, at one point it was all EC2. Now it's serverless first. So that's the only thing in the back of my mind I do get a little bit concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. It's very easy with Lambda because the business logic is, again, if you've done it in a clean code way, you can see your business logic, you can see your domain models, and you know you should have uh, screaming architectures. So it should be very easy to see what that architecture is doing, that, that, that bit of functionality. I, I do worry about in the future as people go all in on serverless and we do have this potential of Lambda pinball. What does that mean for moving off these services in the future? And, and we just don't know. We're just, we're not there yet. Yeah. I guess time will tell on that one. But you know, that sometimes we refer to, to, to vendor lock as a new kind of, you know, threat we, we see, but it's not. Not true. You mentioned that, right? So, so even like 20, 30 years ago, if you were on, I don't know, some Unix machine, you were vendor locked somehow, right? Yeah, on different la layer, but you were there, right? So again, if you used Intel CPUs in your virtual environment, again, the problem is that we with the EMD type of instructions, you cannot go, right? So, so. Are you vendor locked? Yes, you are. <laughs> right. So, so it it's nothing new, nothing terrible, really, right? So we shouldn't be afraid of vendor lock. You mentioned a couple of times if you approach properly to the code, if you approach properly with the proper principles, clean code, clean architecture. If you if you could explain to us a little bit what is the main principle of this? Why why it becomes more and maybe. Yeah, more and more important in our world, like micro nano services, we will see what will be next. Yeah, for me, the, the core principle, and again, it's that sliding scale of complexity. So I talk sometimes about lightweight, clean code, and that's, that's probably as light as I would personally go, which is just ensuring that your, as I call them, primary adapters, they have no notion of business logic whatsoever. They are essentially take input from one AWS service, it could be, like I say, API Gateway, AppSync, it could be an S3 upload event, it could be anything essentially. 
And then obviously you've got what I call a use case, which is your main business logic for that particular use case, which is usually mapped one to one to, you know, it could be an API endpoint, you know, it could be a post request or something like that. But it, essentially it's a, it's a bit of functionality, it, it's a use case. And that should be completely agnostic of any technology. It shouldn't know how the input has actually come in and where it's come from. It just confines to a particular uh, interface or type. And then in the same way, we have secondary adapters. So that use case will talk to a secondary adapter to maybe raise an event or persist some data. But again, it's all about persistence ignorance. It doesn't need to know where that's going, where it's getting persisted. So even just having that very basic kind of abstraction between these three main components that can help massively because that allows you to swap out say event bridge for msk or dynamo db for serverless aurora and the same with the front end but essentially your, your business logic what your business does its business value that isn't actually changing and again if it does you can change that middle part that use case and you don't have to worry about the things around it you know, and it's got added benefits of easier to unit test as, as well and, and easier to, to actually work with day in, day out instead of having these monolithic handlers that I see a lot of in the industry. Yeah, that, that's true and very good and uh, short but complex answer why we should do this in that particular way, especially if we talk about bigger and bigger and bigger applications because uh, the complexity, even we add one service, but the complexity of the business aspects around grows exponentially right so it's not like a one-to-one -one relation right so this is definitely much more to think of so when we talk about serverless the thing is at least in my opinion uh, like in the universe if you gain something you need to lose something and vice versa so with let's say better alignment to our business needs because we can really, really pinpoint our needs and our expectations and our, and the behavior, what we want to achieve, we lose some aspects, uh, especially related to monitoring, right? And then we have another beautiful buzzword called observability. And just to, I hope you agree with me, observability is not just Grafana and Kubernetes. Um, it's Grafana on Kubernetes is just Grafana on Kubernetes. It's tool on another tool. With this clean code principle and proper approach to our architecture, uh, do you think it's easier to apply the proper benefits from the observability as observability should be? This is kind of another adapter which we use to the code? Yeah, so, so a lot of the time when I'm looking at um, clean code, and it, it is very opinionated. Um, you know, there's, there's code repos there, which, which obviously share. But having things embedded in those adapters, like Lambda Power Tools, for example, mm -hmm. so you, you are automatically thinking about, you know, logging and metrics and tracing. So that is something as default that you kind of get with um, having a standard approach. And and that can even be down to things like uh, creating a CLI. I, I wrote an article recently about using Plop to, mm -hmm. to generate um, a lot of this kind of code that, essentially is boilerplate a lot of the time. It's like I say, the adapter itself is boilerplate. The actual repositories, the secondary adapters talking to the data stores. Again, you know, you could, if you've already got these as a, as a module, you can generate all of that automatically and get that, that kind of built in. I think it, it isn't just Lambda though. I think this is one of the issues with clean code. It, it's great for Lambda, that, that's one thing, but there are times where you should be looking at direct integrations where you don't have that injection point to, to do that. So it's all then, you know, if it's API gateway directly to DynamoDB or storage first pattern directly to S3 and asynchronously things happen after that, obviously you have to make sure you've got, you know, uh, the right tracing and uh, logging on the particular service as well, which, which you should have as default. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, Clean code with Lambda doesn't fix all of our problems. I think serverless inherently observability is more difficult than monolithic applications. Um, testing, especially with integration tests and end-to-end tests, 
again, as, as an industry, I don't think from an end-to-end -end perspective, we've solved that from a serverless point of view. It's it's very complex to do, and there aren't a lot of tools out there to, to help with that. So, so you're right. I think there's, there's a lot of benefits to serverless, but you do give up some other areas. It, it, microservices are more complex, obviously, than than you know traditional architectures. Yeah, that that's true, and the complexity is is uh, added from different angles, right? So we mentioned observability. You mentioned Power Tools, which is a really great tool, and generally. It, it works in the same way in all languages where the power tools are implemented. So to start it, you really need Lambda layer and three lines of code. And you have your function instrumented. So why do not use it? Right? It's, uh, it, it's there. It's waiting. We start to see more and more situation where this approach is applied properly to the to the functionality. But you mentioned also that, uh, especially when we talk about tools like software as a service, right, which we have in cloud providers, it's sometimes very often to properly apply the observability principles because we have this break, right? So for example, we have one part of the service, we have second part of the service, and they are connected through, for example, SQS. Right now, SQS is able to properly handle the, for example, request ID or whatever, but some time ago, you need to do it by yourself, right? So so this uh, this brings another layer of thinking process i think even for architects right to be aware of this it's not only about development it's about also about the proper architecture here right it, it is and i think that goes back to that um, kind of architecture layers and and thinking about distributed logging and tracing and thinking about correlation ids causation ids uh, you know these kind of things i think doing that as a standard across a company just helps um, same with what I said earlier about the events, you know, having well-structured events in the right way and looking at event carried state transfer and having certain properties in the meta portion of the event, doing that holistically across an organization, that helps with that process as well. And yeah, I, I think that we put right now the, the burning stick into something because what you said, and I completely agree with you, uh, especially when we talk about enterprises and big applications where multiple teams works on the project and multiple projects even. Agile has, at least in the implementation by us, by people, has some flow. Because very often we see that, oh, team is self-organized. We don't care how they do things. So... If we don't care how team A, B, C, D, Z doing things, how we can ensure <laughs> that this observability, this this uh, common pattern, this governance, like a global governance for the organization is implemented? It's impossible, right? So I think that uh, we need to have this overarching view, right, from people who understand this uh, this application generally architects right they they need to drive and show the direction where, where to go they need to give some tools some options to the teams and somehow well i need to say that force it even yeah that, that's always the difficult thing obviously what you want is autonomous teams um you know autonomous teams work work great but with that kind of guidance and guardrails on certain key aspects like i say having that one esp and that mm -hmm. everybody, you know, is aligned to that, whether that's through enabling teams or through practices or, you know, nobody wants a top-down approach. But there's certain things that um, if you don't agree as a group, you will just get burnt, um, yeah. at, definitely at, at that enterprise level. So I think, again, what happens behind that well-defined versioned API and, you know, behind those events, I think to some extent that the teams can be as autonomous as they need, um, but obviously that sliding scale as teams become more and more autonomous. Say, you know, one thing I'm keen on again around architecture layers is the use of CDK and composable architecture using mm -hmm. all three constructs. So looking at, you know, it could be a construct that has API gateway and a WAF and security of vetted it, and we've got alerting in there, monitoring and CloudWatch dashboards, and as a composable bit of architecture, like a Lego building block, teams can use that. Now, if teams start moving away and start using the serverless framework, for example, within their team, 
they've already lost the ability to use those CDK constructs. Yeah. Um, if they don't confine to that kind of clean code style, they can't use maybe a CLI that's going to auto generate a lot of their boilerplate. So it's a sliding scale, I think, of yeah. how autonomous teams can be. Um, it's the same with um, micro front ends as well. That, that's something mm-hmm. I've been uh, doing work with recently, and that allows teams to have that full vertical, you know, yes. less handoffs and you know reduce cognitive load and what have you within teams, but Again, if they decide to use a completely different technology, maybe then they can't use a shareable component library or design language that's written in another language. So this is where I think it's it's key to get guidance and guardrails at a certain level. But that scale is is a sliding scale, like I say. Exactly, and and you know I, I had some example in my mind uh, quite recently to explain why this you know, self organizing and autonomicity need to be guarded is if we think about crazy example if we think about the four teams which produce four wheels for cars right if they are completely autonomous they can do whatever they want they will produce four different wheels for the same car it it will not work right because on the end of the day the car is the product what we sell right so the organization sell the product not the team so we need to be aligned here right we mentioned this uh, observability monitoring things as a kind of element which adds some complexity to the picture but there is also from the devops perspective a, a very huge complexity which we need to think uh, when we design the process right starting with okay we have microservices or even nano services like lambda but if we put everything to do to the one repository do we still have these microservices or maybe we should think about this differently? Should we have 1000 pipelines because we have 1000 microservices or should we differentiate that, right? And I believe even if it doesn't sound on the first sight like a architect role, especially enterprise architect role, right? Because uh, this kind of person works on different layer. But in my opinion, in fact, this is exactly <laughs> the responsibility of this person, especially in this kind of detached autonomous services we build with microservices with uh, with serverless, right? I, I I hope you agree with me here. I do. Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's working out. Again, it goes down to DDD and um, architecture layers and what what size is that bounded context and how big is that microservice and. And obviously, I'm looking at does it make sense to have it if it's deployed as one composable unit? Is mm. that one repo? But, but again, kind of going back to to that um, kind of shared learning across an organisation and the guidance. You know, if you can't have standard pipelines because pipelines are fairly complex, you know, what what do you have in the pipeline? Do you have acceptance tests and unit tests, integration, synthetic canaries maybe on on AWS or synthetics? Um, do you do fuzz testing, load testing? Yeah. What are the gates that you go through? So again, if you can look at platform engineering, and, and again, that kind of goes back to team topologies and to architecture mm-hmm. layers on that, that kind of bottom layer, that can reduce that cognitive load on teams, you know, build it once and allow teams to use these standard pipelines. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's something I'm quite passionate about as well. Me too, because this this very interesting and ve- very complex topic, right? And doing it right, it's not that easy, right? And from your experience, what was the biggest, uh, what is the biggest challenge here for you uh, with this aspect of of enterprise uh, architecture and enterprise serverless, with the the whole process, right? It, it, it's interesting at the enterprise level um, because a lot of it is patterns and um, looking at guardrails and looking at rather than teams working in silos, trying to get teams to think about the bigger picture, which I work with fantastic teams. So that, that's not a problem. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky, but it's again, thinking um, not siloed into particular services within a domain. It's thinking about things like developer experience and, um, you know, landing zones, for example, we don't want every single serverless team spinning up VPCs and the network and back maybe to on-premise through Transit Gateway maybe. And that is heavy lifting to me, undifferentiated heavy lifting. How can you get um, that in that kind of platform layer? So abstracting the complexities away 
where it's not needed. So a lot of what I do day to day is looking at, at a higher level, I think, you know, like how do we do distributed logging across the estate? You know, the ADA strategy, like I said, around event bridge and the use of that. So it, it is complex, but it is very hands-on. It's not a traditional enterprise architect role as such. It's maybe less about working with the business and more about working with the teams and around technology and, like I say, patterns and, and processes. You want to say that the architect is not the person who just drawing things, but <laughs> he need also to do things. <laughs> That's uh, and and that is good because uh, then you you know what you ask teams to build, right? This is I, I believe this is very important from the uh, architect perspective and also team perspective to build this proper report and credibility in the eyes of the team of for the architect, right? Because this is uh, this is very specific role. Uh, very client slash business oriented, but from other hand also impacting uh, very deeply the the technicalities on the teams. Quite hard role. It, it is, and, and it's not about ivory tower either. It's about you know a, a lot of these great ideas come bottom up through the organization as well, and I think that's where it's really key to have things like architectural working groups, for example, where. Anybody can bring an idea to, to the, the kind of front door of the organization. It's it's about working with teams and not um, telling teams exactly how to do things and, and what to do. Again, it's that kind of fine line about looking across an organization at how you do something, but not telling people how to do things. I think that, that, that is key. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, we could talk for hours uh, about those topics, but uh, we already... Uh, reaching one hour of our discussion, so it's it's Friday. <laughs> so, a last question from my side to you: uh, If you could, because you have a lot of experience, you saw many things. I say very often that I saw many things which I don't want to see again, and I'm sure that you have the same feeling. What will be your advice for people who want to enter this world, especially enterprise serverless? approach what the new adapts new apprentices should take care first and be uh, familiar first before they will just jump into the pool without checking if there is a water or not um for me it's just build 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 it's it's you know whether it's building services and learning through failures and what actually works i think I think that's a key thing. I think in our industry, there's a lot of people trying to get as many certifications as they can, but not actually physically building things because it's only when you fail and um, and actually get big wins that you actually understand it. So I think for me, it's just continuing to, to actually build large services and, and bigger services and obviously keeping an eye on the industry. That's why the community builders um, is great, you know, because you get updates regularly on new services and, you know, jump straight in and just create a repo and, and actually play with that service. And and then once you've done that, share those learnings with other people. I think that that's a key aspect of, of that role as well, you know, sharing what works, sharing ideas and, and POCs. I think, I think that's key. Yeah. And also in this case, in this way, you, uh, fulfill the proper circle, right? So learn, do, teach, mm-hmm. right? So so this is the best way to ensure that you really know what you talk about. Right. right. So we thank you very much for, for your time. And it was a really pleasure to have you and discuss those topics with you. Uh, it was really enjoyable for me. And uh, I learned already uh, many things and many aspects of, especially serverless in the big Uh, environments big organizations because it is different beast so thank you again have a nice day everyone and yeah lee Gilmore was our guest thank you very much again and see you soon thank you very much great thank you thank you for listening to this episode of devops and agile way podcast with your host haveu kivosh subscribe comment and do not forget to check our next episodes Stay tuned, stay safe, stay curious.